you can raise your hand and we'll call on you uh, in the order that you raise your hand. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation uh, and we want to make this as interactive as possible. So, you know, get your questions ready for Doug because he's got the answers. Doug, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, and I want to thank the AOG, the Alstom Owners Group, for hosting this event. I realize that a fair number of people logging on aren't necessarily Alstom owners, um, but that's okay. Uh, there's a lot of uniformity in turbo machinery that uh, I think we can talk about. I also want to say that this is part of a day long failure analysis course that we've offered and I've done my best to cut it down into some important bits so that we can have a, a quick view of some of the things that one does for failure analysis. So without much ado, let's go forward. I did get some pre questions and I'll work those into the discussion as we go. If I forget, somebody remind me. So this is me, um, not a lot of time to spend there. I've been in the business 35 years doing failure analysis and metallurgical work and condition assessments and so on on gas turbines. And as they say in the advertisement for the farmers, uh, we've seen some things. And uh, that always makes life kind of interesting. What we'll cover today, we'll do a, a little introduction into failure analysis, uh, why you might want to do that and define it um, from a business perspective as well as an engineering perspective. We'll look at failure analysis techniques, uh, root cause analysis, and some of the investigation frameworks that you can use to sort of organize your material if you're doing a failure investigation and if you're participating in one, but not even not even running it, it's useful to know how the information might be organized so that you collect the right information. We'll look at some of the investigation methods and testing that's done typically to support uh, failure analysis. And again, this, these types of uh, techniques can be used for anything that fails uh, by any definition of failure, uh, but we'll focus primarily on gas turbines. Uh, we'll also look at some of the mechanical analysis that's often used to support failure analysis. And then in the next section, uh, we'll talk about causes of gas turbine failures. The numbering system's a little bit out of whack, uh, again, because of the fact that this is a pared down uh, version of the course. Um, so we'll look at design factors. You know, why, why are turbines designed to fail, so to speak? Um, how do they operate to failure? Uh, what are the maintenance factors and the repair factors that can connect into common failure modes for gas turbines? And then lastly, we'll go through references. We'll go through some of the standard tests that are used and some uh, web references uh, that you can look for for more information going forward. So let's think about when something fails. Um, <clears throat> and I haven't run hard statistics on this, but I think most facilities will undergo at least one significant gas turbine failure in their lifetime. And <clears throat> what is failure? <clears throat> failure is when a piece of machinery doesn't operate the way that you, the owner, the operator, wants it to, right? It could be a forced outage, or it could be smoke and fire, um, or anything in between, depending on how you define it. Some plants even define, you know, a near miss or something that, could have failed uh, except for maybe one lucky thing that prevented it. Uh, and then consider applying failure analysis type techniques to those near misses with the idea of eliminating failures going forward. So typically, let's just consider failure when a piece of equipment doesn't operate as intended. Right? Okay, so what we do know about the turbine industry is that uh, modern models or newer models have higher failure rates in their early years of introduction. And that's not particularly surprising. New models have new technologies. Often they're not necessarily unproven, but less proven. Um, there's continuous improvements made even to existing models. So anytime you introduce a new product, there are potentially failure modes that you're unaware of um, involved. So that's why these younger serial number engines can be problematic. Now, what drives the change in model numbers, of course, is the desire for in, increased output, increased efficiency, 
reduced emissions. And this is an interesting one, lower costs. Usually cost of manufacture, which translates to cost of ownership in terms of purchasing. So there's a drive for lower costs and sometimes that causes changes that create failures. Um, now, eventually as a product matures, there's design modifications introduced to reduce the failure occurrences and to reduce the consequences of failures. In other words, the parts are made to be more reliable, more robust. Um, but what does failure cost? Well, if you define failure as not operating as intended, a failure to start may mean missing a dispatch and a relatively low cost, so to speak. Um, but generally speaking, when hardware is involved in a failure and parts are broken, you're looking at millions of dollars in lost production, i.e. a machine that's not running, and then you're looking somewhere between half and maybe $10 million in replacement parts costs. Now, if you manage to burn a whole plant down that's right off the scale, that's highly unusual. But usually there's broken parts in a few million dollar sort of ballpark. Um, what happens typically in a failure behind the scenes is a reassessment of risk for that plant. The owners of the plant may change how they want it operated, dispatched. Um, insurance coverage will change. De your uh, deductible and your insurance rates will definitely change. And occasionally, with really bad luck, insurance companies will actually say things like, we're no longer going to co cover you know, model, model X turbine failures that are involved with you know, this part or that part because they're known to be problematic in the industry and you can't get insurance. So that becomes a challenge. The only good thing that I can say about years of doing the failure analysis from a health and safety pers perspective, injuries and fatalities are extremely rare compared to the injuries associated with car crashes and people just falling off of ladders. Um, Turbine failures are usually contained within the turbine shell and therefore there's relatively little uh, fatality or injury involved and that's really a nice thing because I, I really wouldn't relish getting involved in those types of investigations. So graphically speaking, what are we at? If you look at the upper uh, right hand side there, we're looking at causes of failure and you can see that design faults are a very, very common source of failure. Maintenance induced faults and lack of maintenance are also relatively large. So things that are fundamentally wrong from the get go or aren't operated properly are, are a problem. Um, and then there's some other categories, uh, faulty manufacturing, in other words, defective parts or not properly assembled parts, that sort of thing. So those are the typical causes of failure in turbo machinery. Um, if we look at the left hand side sort of curve here, this red curve, this is the classic bathtub curve, and, and these numbers are, are, are this, this, this shape of this curve is somewhat hypothetical. Um, but what we see is a series of high failures associated with commissioning and break-in. So this is where you capture those faulty manufacture, faulty assembly, faulty installation type failures. Um, and then the engine eventually settles down and runs its normal service life at a very low probability of failure. And then as things break down and wear out, the prob probability of failure starts to go up again. So this is kind of the, the end of life. And if you're at all involved in maintenance of gas turbines, ideally what you want to do is you want to do some kind of maintenance interaction in about here on the curve so that you can correct any worn out parts <clears throat> and uh, get new parts in the machine so that you don't actually start to climb this end of the bathtub curve. If you look at the cost of failure, that's the lower right hand curve. And what we're showing here is for different megawatt sized engines, the dollars spent or so in terms of insurance claims go up dramatically when you talk about sort of 100 megawatt size machines and larger and smaller uh, engines have much, much smaller insurance claims. And one of the key reasons for that is the small engines are often, you can pick up the old engine, get rid of it, pop in a new engine and get back and running again. So that's the effect of the loss of production in the insurance claim. So big engines where you cannot just pick them up and swap them out uh, are susceptible to large loss of production uh, expenditures. <clears throat> so failure analysis. One of the things that I want to express about it is 
A failure is the opportunity after the disaster, right? When you do a failure analysis, the idea is to find out what went wrong, why? Not so that you can point fingers at Tom or Betty and say you did something wrong, but I think importantly, think about it as an opportunity to reduce the risk of the failure reoccurring. Once it's happened, you do not want to be embarrassed enough to have it happen again. And if you've got a fleet, three, five, seven, twenty, a hundred engines, you want all those engines, other engines to operate properly. So you want to make sure that whatever caused engine A to fail doesn't affect B, C, D down the line. Right? So you're trying to do that. You do that by identifying all of the at-risk components in the system um, and changing those out or correcting them or modifying them. Uh, as required. Sometimes failure analysis is used to assign responsibility typically for commercial reasons such as insurance claims or litigation if it comes to that typically some kind of commercial uh, arrangement is, is, is found. But here's the real key thing for me for failure analysis. All failure analysis efforts should lead to some kind of corrective action. Um, I actually once had a failure analysis uh, that I read and the, the person that wrote it said something along the lines of if this engine had been built to OEM specifications, maintained to OEM specifications, operated to OEM specifications, it would not have failed. Well, that's not particularly helpful. You've got to say what's, you know, what's the corrective action that we can do um, and be specific because we're looking to, again, reduce that failure of reoccurrence. So what is failure analysis? Well, typically it reveals a chain of events, typically chronologically from the event going backwards in time, uh, trying to figure out what had gone wrong. So for example, very simple straight line here, if we had a blade with a fatigue failure, um, we might say, what's the cause of the fatigue? Well, maybe it's a resonance and the blade is vibrating in the engine. What's the cause of the resonance? Well, maybe the part is bent or or out of shape or, or, or for some reason the wrong dimensions and therefore is resonant. And so what would be the cause? This is the actionable discovery. Well, if it was bent during in installation, more care during the installation, you know? So very simply, that's just chronologically working backwards in time. Now, what often is the case is there's multiple contributing factors that can exist. So the chain can have branches, right? So the part may be bent during installation. Well, was it bent during shipping or was it bent during handling or did it not fit into the engine very well and somebody took a hammer and just started whacking on it? So there can be branches and contributing factors and sometimes they can be sources of help as well in terms of eliminating future failures. Now, typical, there's, mul there's multiple engineering uh, disciplines involved. Uh, typical investigations involve a lot of materials engineering work but also mechanical engineering work. So we're gonna look at the material of construction, the coatings that are involved, what other manufacturing factors are there. But we'll also look at heat transfer, stress, aerodynamics, and so on, to find out the effect of service on the component and therefore why it may have failed. All right, so our root cause failure analysis determines the events at the start of the chain that lead to a correctable action. That's the key thing that I want to remember. And not all failure analysis efforts are really actually truly root cause analysis. So if you're buying a, you know, a failure uh, analysis, make sure that there's a good understanding between the analyst and yourself as to what you want to achieve. I have been in situations where people want just the very simplest failure analysis because they have to tick a box in an insurance form that there's been an investigation. They want to sink a lot of money and effort and time. Well, so be it if that's your case. But the point is, make sure you're getting what you paid for by making sure you ask for what you need. So at this point here, we'll see if there's any really initial questions before we move on. Um, and if you are, you know, use your hand up symbol or something like that, and, uh, and we'll address those. And I just realized that they pop up on my screen for just a fraction of a second before I can read them. So let me see if I can figure out how to get them on my screen properly. Hey Doug, I'll, I'll handle the questions. Um, okay, thank you, Scott. So, uh, first question is, do you insist on getting MTCE records and performance trends for failure analysis? 
they're often very, very helpful um, to get the trends out. Um, if you see vibrations trending upwards, for example, that's a classic. Um, if you see temperatures in, in you know, disc cavities or whatever trending upwards. So that information can be very valuable. From time to time, it's not because the failure happens so quickly that the historian doesn't necessarily pick it up, you know, sort of lightning strike, uh, bird strike sort of stuff. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I hesitate to use the word insist, but I, it is a very, very helpful tool. And knowing how to extract that data and read it is very useful. I often get involved with the plants operators to extract that information because all the different units have, you know, different protocols. Okay, uh, who typically pays for failure analysis? <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the rate payer at the end of the day always pays, right? Um, typically it's paid for by the plant, although I'm under the impression that a lot of insurance companies will either uh, sponsor it or co-pay it or somehow discount it. That's kind of the classic failure analysis. Um, However, from time to time, we would be hired by an insurance company who wants to investigate a claim, um, particularly if they're thinking about going towards uh, litigation. Uh, once in a blue moon, as an expert witness, I'll be hired by a lawyer. So it does vary, but I would say, statistically speaking, it's typically the plant that's involved. Um, if you're with an OEM, you might have your own failure investigation department that kind of operates in parallel to what might be done in the field, you know, to protect your own commercial interests. Okay, um, and then final question for now uh, came in from a user. Um, so over the years, many of us have experienced design related faults and we're seeing it now on advanced H class units. One of the frustrating realities is that the OEMs have done a wonderful job of positioning, posturing, uh, that all of these design faults are things we just have to pay for to upgrade to fix. How can the third parties like yourself at Liberty help companies fight back and change the narrative? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> um, somebody once said to me what I thought was rather brilliant. They said, it's fascinating how the OEMs can sell as an upgrade what they should have done properly in the first place. Um, and I think that sums up the feeling that you have. Uh, definitely uh, getting an independent failure analysis helps you position the situation such that first off, they don't just blame everything the operator does, right? A uh, very common thing for, for an OEM to do, and I apologize for the OEM people who are online. I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Um, but the very first thing they do is they say, oh, we've never seen this before. Maybe, maybe not. Um, then they say, oh, well, it's got to be your fuel, your air, your wash water, your oil, something that the operator has put into the system because that's what the operator puts in, and, and obviously that's not their problem. So there is a tendency to sort of blame it always on corrosion from bad batch of fuel and stuff. And yes, that does happen. But if you get your own analysis done, you can find out whether that's a contributing factor or a causal factor and how strong, and you can start to fight back against that kind of, uh, of thing. In terms of changing the design product release philosophy, that's harder for an operator to do. But I think the insurance companies themselves might have some, some uh, traction there. I have heard of insurance companies saying we will not cover engine serial numbers 1 to 10, for example, uh, because they're considered prototypes, pre-production prototypes. And when an insurance company makes a blanket statement like that, that sends out a very, very strong message to the manufacturers, and maybe that's helpful. So I hope that answers the question. It's uh, it's a very philosophical question. And speaking of philosophy here, we've got a lovely picture here that I I found of uh, that's supposed to be Elon Musk. And uh, this is a quote that uh, that Musk had said once failure is an option here. He's talking about SpaceX. If things are not failing, you're not innovating enough. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. We typically don't look at it like that in the power or the flight industry.
Um, so that's kind of an interesting viewpoint. So let's move on. Okay, so, um, and we went to the wrong section, I think. Sorry about that, folks. Let me just pull up the right one. Okay, have you got the causes of gas turbine failures? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so this is the the longer part of the of the effort this afternoon, um, and we're going to look at some of these uh, sort of design factors and operational factors and maintenance factors and, and repair factors. In other words, the things that make failures occur and uh, what sort of to look out for. And if you understand these design factors and, and operational factors, etc., um, then when you're doing your operations, you can keep these in mind and, and be extra vigilant. If you want to avoid failure, vigilance is key. You need to be looking out for potential problems. Uh, that's very, very important. If you've ever seen the crews climb over top of gas turbines during maintenance and they record every little gap and clearance and so on and so forth, that's not just for fun. That's really to understand that everything is just right and should something go wrong, you know, where was it before something went wrong so they can understand it and, and correct it. So let's have a little fun with these. So we'll look at design factors first. These are just sort of chronologically, if you were to own and operate a plant, um, that these are organized. So what are the design factors? Well, typically in a modern gas turbine, high compression ratios and high, and temp high temperatures drive efficiency. And of course, since we're burning fuel and fuel is expensive, we want high efficiency. If we're in the flight industry, we want high thrust to weight ratios. So again, we want high efficiency of the engine and high mechanical efficiency of the components themselves. So those are the driving factors and the plots below here aren't super important, but they're simply showing that the pressure ratio drives up higher efficiency as the pressure ratio goes up. And this shows a pressure ratio of 25 to one, which is pretty typical for an industrial machine. Flight engines have 30 to one, even up to 40 to one pressure ratios. And here we're showing the turbine inlet temperatures increasing and again, the efficiency going up. So that's just saying that that uh, high temperatures and high compression ratios are are good. So having said that, we do see a lot of failures involved in sealing systems. In other words, maintaining high pressure ratios and at high temperature failure modes, burning, hot corrosion, uh, you know, and high temperature type issues. So not surprisingly, we see those types of, uh, of failure modes occurring in gas turbines quite regularly. So let's step through a gas turbine. We'll start at the front end and look at some of the components and why they might be susceptible to failure modes. So typically compressors run at low temperatures, particularly the front stages and, and, and low from a combustion and turbine section perspective. Um, so the rotating parts, especially the discs, have extremely high centrifugal loads on them, very high tensile overloads uh, or tensile loads. So we do tend to see tensile overload type failures occurring, particularly when something is upset, not that the parts are run to burst, but if there's a defect in the manufacturer, they can burst. Um, they run up to sort of like 80, 90% of uh, tensile yield. So they're really highly loaded. Um, then in the compressor, you've got a lot of individual blades and veins, of course, and each one of those as air flows this way through the compressor, it hits those blades and veins and it leaves wakes and creates turbulence. All right. So because of that, we've got a lot of aerodynamic impulses throughout the compressor that leads to high cycle fatigue type cracking, a very common compressor problem. So what happens is the blades and veins, which are typically cantilevered, will vibrate or twist and that will cause cracking and the cracking could lead to parts coming off or outright failure. So that's a fairly common failure mode from compressors. And then lastly, um, compressors are air, are, or turbines are air breathing machines and therefore compressors are subject to damage from whatever gets drawn in with the air. So that can lead to corrosion things like uh, salt water based corrosion. 
It can also lead to erosion. If it's sucking in sand or other debris, you can get impact damage, you can get erosion, which is a microscopic debris kind of effect, um, particularly in wet or dusty conditions. In other words, when the air is not clean. So these are challenges that uh, gas turbines have. Now, typically industrial machines will have a filter house, so they're less prone to erosion. But having said that, they'll run for 25, 30, 50,000 hours, and therefore there's a lot of tonnage of air going through these machines. Typical 100 megawatt type machine will draw in the volume of air of a typical house in one second. Now, if your house is anything like mine, you probably got a lot of dirt and dust. And that's a lot of potential erosion going through a turbine every day. So let's look a little bit closer at uh, the issue with compressors and this high cycle fatigue issue, because this is really, really important, very common failure mode. Um, compressor airfoils are typically designed to prevent or avoid resonance. In other words, you can, you can test a blade or you can analyze a blade's shape with a computer and you can say it's going to vibrate at a certain frequency. Um, so then you make sure that you operate the engine so that that frequency is not excited. Or if it is excited, you change the shape of the blade so that it does no longer in resonance. So that's a very typical thing to do. So what this plot is showing here, it's called a Campbell diagram. It shows the resonant frequencies here on this axis vertically, and then the rotor speed across the horizontal axis here. And then mode one, mode two, mode three are the vibration shapes of a blade. So if we've arbitrarily got an airfoil, let's say standing up like this, mode one would be it flapping back and forth. Mode two might be a, a twist and mode three might be a curl, that sort of a thing. So different modes are defined. And then we look at the excitation frequency. Um, so this line here that says two, that's the excitation frequency for two uh, excitations per revolution of the compressor uh, wheel itself. And for three impacts or three, three excitations per rotation and four, so on and so forth. So for example, if we were running this particular turbine and we were running it at a rotor speed of 3000 RPM, which would be very typical for a 50 Hertz machine, and if we had three first stage bearing struts, we would have a problem because the three per revolution line here intersects the mode one flap of that blade at 3000 RPM. So that engine would be prone to failure if one were to run it at a 50 Hertz situation. Now at 60 Hertz, that's not an overlap. It's not a problem. So this is the way that the engineering team would use such a diagram for each type of airfoil all the way down the compressor and the turbine for that matter to find out that there are nothing or to find out what could resonate and then design so that it doesn't resonate. So what that defines is the basic shape of the compressor. Now, where this all goes to pot is if you're running at a restricted speed, okay? This assumes that you're gonna run at certain RPMs. And if we're in the power industry, we're in pretty good shape because we usually have defined RPMs, 3,000, 3,600, uh, 5,000 or so if you've got a gearbox or, or whatever. Um, but if you're in the flight industry or if you're in the mechanical drive industry, you can have a much broader range of speeds depending on what output horsepower you're going to need. So you have to watch out for the fact that you, you want to run only in the allowable speed ranges and you want to avoid the prohibited speed ranges. And the reason they're prohibited is there could be a, an interaction here. So that's how you use this diagram. And from a failure analysis point of view, these are very useful diagrams to try and figure out what may have gone wrong and why a part may have broken. Okay. Other ways of uh, designing out um, resonance and designing and minimizing this type of problem. This picture here is a, a fluid dynamics calculation. These are in the guide veins. And then you've got a row of blades and another row of veins. And this is simply showing the uh, wakes that occur downstream of those airfoils. 
And you can see that as the blades rotate, they cut those wakes periodically. So one of the things that's done, for example, is where this row of veins here interacts with this row of veins here, they may position those rows such that the wake that's coming off of the upstream stage doesn't necessarily hit the downstream stage. So, you know, stage one is not exciting stage two, stage two is not exciting stage three. So getting those lined up properly, we consider that's a, the word they use often for that is clocking. To clock the compressor is to make sure that those, those stages are positioned that way. Um, I'm not sure that that was always done. I think uh, in antiquity when engines probably had longer axial compressors, it was less of a problem or seemed to be. Um, but a lot more attention is paid to that nowadays. And typically when things aren't clocked properly, we don't necessarily see red, uh, outright fatigue failures, but we often see accelerated wear of the attachment uh, dovetails or the feet that hold the parts in place, uh, which means short lifetimes. Um, so that's a bit of a more subtle effect. Uh, another thing that can be used to control uh, Resonance is to put dampers in. If you look at the picture here, you can see there's a mid span ring here. That's a series of, of dampers that uh, absorb energy, vibrational energy, and stop that compressor fan in this instance here from, from vibrating, and that eliminates failures. Other ways, other things that we need to deal with in compressor. Um, Compressor blades and to a lesser extent, the veins are all designed to have slip fits. There's hardly anything in a gas turbine that's bolted together. Almost everything is slip fitted together. And that's because of a couple of different reasons having to do with thermal expansion. But one of the other advantages of the sort of classic dovetail attachment is the dovetail in the socket in the wheel or disc uh, can vibrate just ever so slightly and that friction will absorb the vibrational energy dissipated as heat and therefore avoid failure of the blade. So it's really an energy absorption mechanism, the classic dovetail. Um, now, in some instances, the material of construction is such that the oxide scale that builds up on it can be rather uh, aggressive, uh, rather abrasive, and the material itself is relatively soft. So aluminum compressors and titanium compressors are relatively soft materials compared to stainless steel, for example. And so it's very common that to coat the dovetails with something soft and cushiony to prevent that, uh, that micro motion from causing what we call fretting wear um, and damaging those parts. So typically it's a nickel, uh, copper, indium sort of coating that's put on here. There's a micrograph of it here. Uh, it's a soft coating and it cushions the contact in there. Other things that can go on in compressor failure modes um, is unwanted material in the compressor, right? Impact failure. Um, so you, I've got a picture here. This is a flight engine fan. That's a bird strike or something like that went into that engine. Um, over here is the industrial equivalent of it. There's a bent tip on this blade here. That's an inlet. Uh, a row there of inlet guide vanes. And this, uh, this lower left picture is most likely an ice strike from ice built up in the compressor housing that broke off and, and hit the blade. Um, that happens a fair amount in the winter in Canada here. Um, this picture here shows a, a beat up compressor fan. Um, and one of the things that we can do from a failure analysis is look at those impact sites and try and figure out what's on the surface and sometimes that bruise leaves a little bit of debris or or as whatever the foreign material is rubs across it leaves a little trace of itself and you can analyze that chemically and find out what that was i mean the real simple way to think about it is uh you know the miracle on the hudson plane they took the feathers out of the machine and found out what type of 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 goose it was um that caused that particular bird strike and that failure. Um, interestingly enough, we did tour the uh, facility that did that investigation. And not only they knew they were Canada geese, no surprise, but they knew that they were two females and one male <laughs> that hit that particular plane. So quite interesting things one can do metallurgically in that case. <laughs> 
Now, when we do have a lot of uh, unwanted material, particularly in the compressor, we get this erosion phenomena, which is the removal of material. It causes roughening of the airfoil surfaces. That creates an aerodynamic penalty, which means the compressor isn't as efficient, which means the control system ups the firing temperature. That shortens the life of the whole turbine section. So that's not a good thing. But if you leave that to go long enough, you will get material loss. And what the picture here on the lower right is showing is a stack of compressors. And you can see that the airfoils are not nice and square at the top. They're, they're cut off at the trailing edges. They're rounded over here at the leading edges. So what's happening is there's material loss. And we're actually changing the shape of the airfoils. They're actually physically changing. And because of that, their resonance frequencies are changing. So back to that Campbell diagram, we're maybe moving into a situation where we've got an overlap on the Campbell diagram and that's leading to resonance. And then once you've got resonance, you can get cracking and then fracture and failure quite quickly. So the picture on the lower left here is showing the end view of a blade. Uh, there's the dovetail root and you can see the airfoil shape and there's an initiation site and then a large fatigue crack that's occurred. And that's, a, that's an erosion type failure. Other things in the compressor, we mentioned that uh, sealing is really important. You can get rubs in the tips of the, the blades or the veins on the inner casing um, when the clearances are too close or if the system goes out of alignment or if the bearings are not, uh, not holding. There's a variety of reasons you can get those rubs. Those cause initially a loss of sealing efficiency, um, which again, you pay for in terms of energy burn a fuel burn. They can also release debris. That debris can build up on other parts and cause subsequent problems. The picture that's on the upper right here shows a bunch of debris built up on the lower airfoil of a stator section. And what you see here, the circle, this uh, hole is a bleed. So this is where we're taking air that's going to go into the, the turbine and cool the turbine. So if we've got that debris flying through there, and going into that bleed hole, that's going to screw up our bleed valves. It's going to start plugging up cooling holes in our turbine. So we can have a failure in the turbine that the root cause is related to a compressor rub. Right? If we get a bad enough rub, here's a picture of a casing here showing a rub. You can see where the surface of the tip has impacted the top. This is the corresponding blades and you can see the rub marks. If that gets bad enough, long enough, you can get cracks basically grinding cracks coming in from the tip. And here's a penetrant inspection done on a blade tip. And you can see indeed there's a, a crack that's engine radial going into that airfoil. If you have really bad luck, that crack can propagate and you can start losing pieces of the airfoil. Now that probably won't crash the engine, but that you have to think about where that piece is going downstream and whether it's doing a pinball thing and, not, and, and banging up a bunch of airfoils going downstream. Okay, so let's just take a quick pause here on compressors. Are there any questions on compressor failures that we can answer at this point? Hey, Doug, uh, we got a couple of questions in the chat for you. Um, can you discuss some issues related to fatigue failure in blades and how to identify those through vibration analysis? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, generally speaking, gas turbines will have vibration sensors on them, typically associated with the bearings. Unfortunately, those sensors are usually not sufficiently sensitive nor tuned to pick up blade vibration. Usually they'll pick up bearing vibration, which is what their job is. Um, it, I can't say that I have seen good clear vibration signals coming in from the sort of onboard transducers. So to get away from that on some machines, certainly on experimental machines, there are blade tip, uh, blade tip timing sensors. And every time a blade passes across the sensor, it sends a signal, bing, 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 bing. And one can literally look at those signals and do a, a Fournier analysis on the frequencies and if you see a split, then you know that those blades are out of position. They're not uniformly uh, positioned, which means that they're probably vibrating. Um, so those types of sensors can pick that up. 
So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, can you address fatigue crack initiation and propagation reduction with surface modifications such as shot painting? Sure. Okay. Um, ironically, in this presentation, I did not get into a lot of metallurgy, and, and part of the reason I did is time. Um, and the other thing I want to say is Kevin Weens has written a, a chapter of the ASM materials handbook on turbo machinery. Um, failures, so I want to encourage you all to go out and get that book and have a look at that. Um, but quickly speaking, when you have a fatigue failure, you need 2 things for fatigue failure to occur. 1 is you need an excitation force uh, or a forcing function, something causing a reversal or a change in stress level, which when we talk about turbine blading, we're topically, typically talking about a, a vibrating blade. And the other thing we need is an initiation site somewhere for the strains of that movement to be localized. Um, and at that localization point, there's a microscopic uh, exceeding of the yield stress for the material. In other words, you cold work the material in one little teeny tiny spot. Where you cold work the material in that little spot, it's much like bending a paper clip. Eventually you'll get a crack and then the vibration that crack will drive further and further across the surface until the mechanical load can no longer be sustained by the remaining intact metal and then you'll have a failure you'll have a blade off so if i go back to that high cycle fatigue picture on the previous slide here and if you look real closely here you can see there's an initiation site here it could have been an impact for example a stone or something that went in that engine it could be a corrosion pit it could be a manufacturing defect such as an inclusion in the metal or a pour um, and then that little initiation site became an area where that strain was localized and then with each vibration back and forth that crack grew out slowly again and again leaving a relatively smooth area here that has uh, basically a series of striations or clamshell marks that indicate where the crack front was at any given time and that grows out bigger and bigger and bigger until the remaining intact metal, which is the gray area here, uh, can no longer support the remaining the blade tip, and then the tip flies off in service. Can you see my my arrow when I move it around on the screen? Yes. Okay. So that's the sort of classic way that a fatigue fracture will occur, um, and you need that forcing function and you need that initiation point. The bigger the forcing function the smaller the initiation point can be to result in a crack. So, for example, if your initiation force or your forcing function is strong enough, then a grain boundary or a little carbide, something that's normally totally benign in the alloy or a small surface scratch, machining mark, could be big enough to cause a fatigue crack to occur. That's when you have a big forcing function. When you have a small forcing function, but a big initiation site, such as an impact pit or a corrosion pit, um, then it takes a lot less force to drive that crack. So from a metallurgist point of view, looking at the relative size of the initiation site um, helps us understand whether we're looking for a big forcing function or a relatively small forcing function. So we can get a lot of information out of a fatigue failure fracture surface. Okay, any other right. questions? Yeah, there's a there's quite a, there's quite a few. So let's uh, let's let's stick with it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, erosion prevention on compressor blades? Sure. Um, the easiest way to prevent erosion is not to have any debris, any sand go into the engine. Easier said than done. Any filter that you put in front of a gas turbine is going to have a pressure drop. And if high pressure ratios mean high efficiency, then you do not want pressure drops uh, in front of your gas turbine. Having said that, um, and in some helicopters, for example, there will be uh, filters or particle excluders, which are usually some kind of inertial uh, particle uh, removal technique. If you look at a turbofan engine and you look at the shape of the shaft, it often comes in with kind of a bell shape that then goes back down. 
and the idea is to throw the debris outwards into the fan bypass section of the duct and not let any debris go down into the core engine and damage the high pressure compressor. So there's a variety of different mechanical techniques to exclude or to filter out um, erosive particles. Now, having said that, another way of dealing with it is managing the erosive particles. So you can put anti-erosion coatings, for example, on your compressor airfoils. So things like titanium nitride, which is a thin, solid ceramic film, can be put on the compressor blades so that when the particles that do come in, uh, they get bounced off. Um, interestingly enough, they actually can fracture and become powdered going through the compressor. So putting on an anti-erosion film is a, is a good technique. Another technique is to putting an erosion shield on. We do this on steam turbines all the time and on fans for uh, turbo fans. We put a leading edge that is uh, a harder metal than the base material. And that leading edge's job is to sort of take the brunt of the impact and, and ricochet the part off without having a nick or a ding that could be fatal to the part. So there's a variety of different techniques that can be done. Okay, uh, how are how is the compressor section affected by surge or stall events? How common are they, and can they cause failures? <laughs> yes, they can. Um, so surge and stall. First thing we have to understand is a little bit of aerodynamics. So if you look at a compressor blade in cross section, it's uh, relative to the incoming air is coming at what they call an angle of attack, um, and it's of course pushing the air down. Um, and so the idea is if that angle of attack is too high, then what happens is the air goes over it and creates a lot of turbulence on the backside. And that's a, a condition they call stall. The airfoil loses its lift. Okay. If it happens on the wing of a plane, you fall out of the sky. When it happens in a comp rotating turbine compressor, we call that stall. Now, typically during the start cycle, when the engine is speeding up, there's all kinds of stalls that happen inside the compressor as it sort of sets up its nominal flow. Um, generally speaking, once the engine reaches operational speed, you're no longer in a stall situation and you shouldn't be in a stall situation. However, from time to time, something can go wrong and it can be, um, you know, a bird strike, for example, that disrupts the airflow. It could be a bleed valve that acts poorly for some reason or other. It could be a bad rub caused by, uh, say, an ev evasive maneuver of a, of a fighter jet or something like that. Um, and then you can get what they call surge. And that's when the whole compressor, not just a few airfoils, but the whole compressor essentially stalls. And then what happens is the high pressure air that's stored up in the combustor section of the turbine burps out the front of the engine with a loud bang and even in some cases bringing some flame with it so there'll be a, a puff of flame for a fraction of a second out the front of the engine it's a very scary thing to happen ideally it burps and then starts to speed up again and it keeps on running in a perfect world and that, most engines nowadays are pretty robust but back in the 50s and 60s not so much and these were more of a problem now, what damage does a stall do? A stall is an excitation of those blades, so it can create cracks and drive cracks. Um, a surge can do the same thing, but because a surge is so violent over the whole compressor, it can actually bend turbine blades. And so you get turbine blade, or sorry, compressor blades that are physically bent towards the inlet from the pressure of the air blowing across them during, during surges. So, the damage that you get from stalls and surges are going to be fatigue cracks, rubs, and possibly actual bending of the airfoils. So that's why it's important to avoid them. Um, if you happen to be an ASME member, <clears throat> you can check out this month's Mechanical Engineering Magazine. There's an article actually uh, towards the back of the magazine where they talk about some modern ways of looking at vibration data to try and find the onset of surge. Surge can occur in tens of milliseconds. So most instrumentation cannot operate quickly enough to spot it and do anything corrective. And what these, uh, this article talks about 
some new techniques that are trying to uh, spot these uh, onsets even more quickly so that they can prevent surges from occurring. I'm not aware, aware of that being commercially utilized, but uh, maybe it's the next thing down the road. All right, let's get into some icing. Um, okay. We've got one question. Uh, how often have you seen ice damage on machines without anti-icing systems? Uh, I've seen ice damage half a dozen times in the past 35 years. Not super, super common. Um, <clears throat> So I wouldn't say it's super common. The reason that you have anti-icing is just that, to control it. Uh, I know in at least one instance, the, the anti-icy system was turned off uh, due to an operator misunderstanding, an operator error, um, and that led to some icing damage. I'd say that's probably the most common industrial Likelihood is when the anti-icing anti system isn't on or isn't, manuf isn't performing properly. To a lesser extent, I guess you can get ice ingestion in any flight engine because they typically do not have uh, anywhere near the anti-icing capability of an industrial machine. Um, often it's relatively simple uh, systems of bleeds. Okay, and uh, can you elaborate on the icing frost damage uh, of the first stage and perhaps show that picture one more time? Sure thing. Oops, wrong way. Yeah, it's the lower left picture here. And typically what I've seen from an icing perspective is a few relatively large impacts. In other words, a chunk of ice, the size of an ice cube maybe, uh, builds up on the inlet plenum typically and then breaks free and goes through in the engine. You get one or two big bangs. You don't tend to get a whole bunch of little bangs or tears, <clears throat> such as the lower middle picture in this diagram here. You tend to get one or two big bangs. That's my experience. Again, it's not super, super common, so uh, there could be variations out there. Okay, and uh... it's typically blades, not veins. Okay. Our compress. Wait, just one more. Um, sure. Our compressor VGVs able to improve partial load efficiency. Or well, that's is it just a new concern added to the compressor stages? Well, variable variable inlet guide vanes. Remember, we talked about that angle of attack issue associated with stall and surge. Well, one way of getting an engine up to speed without so much stalling occurring and surging occurring is to change the angle of attack. Now, the blades you can't move. They're physically rigid in the disc. However, the vein that guides the air coming in can be changed so that it changes that angle of attack and makes it a lower angle so it's less likely to stall. So that's exactly what inlet guide vanes are designed to do. They change the angle of attack so that there's less loading aerodynamic loading on the compressor and therefore the airflow stays uniform and in an unstalled laminar situation going through the compressor. And that's really important during the run up to full speed. Uh, that's most commonly where it's used, part load operation. Um, that, that's where variable guide vanes come into, the, come into play. So if the, the question is, can you use variable guide vanes to operate at lower Speeds, yes, definitely. At lower power levels, um, at constant speed, I'm not quite sure of that. I think what happens is when you close the inlet guide vanes at a constant speed machine, you end up driving up the exit temperature, which is good if you're a combined cycle plant, to my understanding. All right, um, there is one more question. Uh, and then we can move on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, compressive blade inspections? Uh, and the some folks are of the opinion that normal die pen will find them, uh, find cracks in compressor blades, and others are in the, the mag particle testing school. 
Um, you just like to hear your thoughts on on which uh, which techniques you you think are the best. We will talk about inspections later, but uh, briefly speaking, dye penetrant. The theory is that if there's a crack, the penetrant goes into the crack and is retained in the crack while you wash off the surface, and then bleeds back out the surface of the crack after you've washed it out. You may use something on the surface to help draw the dye back out of the crack. So if you look in this slide here and you look at the picture here, what we've done here is we put a red dye. Red is just convenient color, easy for the eye to see, on the part, washed it off, and then sprayed it with something akin to talcum powder. And the talcum powder draws, by capillary force, draws the dye out of the crack and makes it easy for the inspector to see it and measure it, and then you can make a decision as to whether it's a problem or not. That's dye penetrant. Fluorescent penetrant's the same thing, glow in the dark. The advantage of glow in the dark is, again, it's easy on the eyes to see, that's all. Magnetic particle is a little different. Um, although there's often a dye associated with magnetic particle, the important thing is that you magnetize the part, and if there's a discontinuity in the metal of the part, the magnetic field will go around that discontinuity, causing a, oh, let's call it a pinch point in the magnetic field. And then if you put uh, some magnetic media, such as very fine ground up uh, iron or iron oxide, it will deposit on the surface, but it will tend to cluster in that magnetic pinch point. And therefore it will produce, uh, uh, if you've got some dye in there, you can visually see where the material is building up and you can infer that there's a mag there's a there's a defect there now mag particle because you're looking at discontinuities in the metal it can find not only surface cracks but it can find subsurface cracks such as voids or tears that are under the surface or for that matter under a coating um, because they will cause a magnetic loop line that goes around the defect in other words you don't have to have a defect open to the surface for the technique to be useful. So they're complementary techniques. Um, and for compressors, if you've got a stainless steel compressor, a magnet, magneti, magnetable, is that a word? If you've got a compressor alloy that you can use a magnet on, then mag particle can be quite useful for finding not only surface, but subsurf, subsurface damage as well. So um, they're both good techniques. Um, You'd have to speak to an inspector to decide whether or not one is more sensitive to the other. Um, I know in our shop we use both techniques. I think mag particle is faster for magnetic alloys. Um, that's one of its convenience things is it's relatively fast. In the field where parts are dirty, they might be more sensitive because dirt can interfere with dye penetrant. So I hope that helps. Okay, let's move on to the uh, combustor section. So again, we talked about uh, turbine engines um, and we talked about the efficiency of them. So typically we want the parts to get hot and because we're now moving into the combustor section, we're talking about areas that are hot. Um, and interestingly enough, we're also talking about areas that are cold relative to areas that are hot. In other words, things like thermal fatigue strains. Um, so there's a problem though, as we try to raise the temperature of the engine to make the engines more efficient, there's a limit to what engineering materials can survive. And they certainly cannot survive adiabatic temperatures of, of combustion. So we have to cool our combustion air down before we can let it go into the turbine section proper. Um, and so we do that by diluting it typically with air, excess air from the compressor. Um, so that's one of the key things we have to do. Now, there are materials that can, can withstand very high temperatures, um, say tungsten, molybdenum, uh, carbon, for example, but often those materials are too expensive or too difficult to manufacture into useful shapes. So we're stuck using stainless steels and nickel alloys and cobalt alloys that are economical um, and shapeable, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so let's look at some combustor sort of known failure modes or some risk factors. So first thing in the combustor is the fuel nozzles. Fuel nozzles, first off, they're assemblies. So 
there's all sorts of opportunities for assembly type problems to occur. Um, we often see though in practice plugged or misaligned fuel nozzles. Fuel nozzles that are not injecting the fuel the way that they are originally intended. Um, that's a big problem. Plugged fuel nozzles or partially plugged fuel nozzles such that they're not atomizing liquid fuels properly or they're not distributing gaseous fuels properly. Those are going to be challenged areas. Um, we'll often see a clue of that type of a failure occurring in exhaust gas temperature spreads. There may or may not be trips. Um, those non-uniform temperatures around the periphery can create fatigue type excitation. So we can see high cycle fatigue problems as well. We'll often see hot spots in the combustion section, whether it's in the fuel nozzle itself or in the plumbing piping downstream of the fuel nozzles. We'll see TMF, that's thermal mechanical fatigue, and that's uh, basically a cracking caused by differential thermal expansions between the hot side and the cold side, for example. Um, we'll often see overheating, burning of material uh, because of non-uniform fuel injection. From time to time, we may see debris, either domestic debris, in other words, something's burning and therefore releasing burning burnt scales that are then causing problems downstream, such as plugging of cooling holes. Um, to a lesser extent, debris such as, uh, you know, I have seen during maintenance cycles, people put uh, cloths or tape or something over a fuel nozzle with the intention of keeping it clean, but sometimes that stuff actually gets stuck inside the pipe. And then when it goes into service, you've got a problem, you've got a, a plugged up fuel nozzle. So in the picture down here below, I've got a fuel nozzle and you can see these swirler areas here have got what looks like the remnants of a wiper rag or something like that that have gotten stuck in the swirler holes. Um, that's not unheard of on piston engines either. Um, this picture here is showing an effusion plate behind a, uh, the, the fuel nozzles go through these holes here. And you can see there's a whole bunch of little cracks that are occurring in these holes. Now, back to this concept of uh, air dilution, the need to introduce dilution air into the combustion stream to cool it so that it's safe to go into the turbine means that there's all kinds of holes, all kinds of louvers and other gaps and things. And every one of those is a structural discontinuity and therefore is a stress intensity factor, which means it can become a place for a fatigue crack to occur. And the other interesting thing about combustors is in order to get the gas to mix, they need turbulence. And that turbulence itself can excitate or excite thin areas and cause thin areas to vibrate and cracks to form. So that's the sort of thing that's happening here in this effusion plate. Here we have a borescope picture again with some kind of foreign material, burnt up cloth or whatever that's gotten into a fuel nozzle. Um, and here we have an example of what can happen when the fuel nozzles are not injecting uniformly. And we've got a hot streak down here and a relatively cool area here. And that causes that combustion liner Basically, it's a thin walled pipe to bend and distort. It becomes no longer round and therefore no longer feeds the gas in an ideal format. So those are the sort of the fuel nozzle related challenges that we can have. Now, one of the fun things that we're going to see coming forward is what the hell is hydrogen gas going to do for us? Kerosene burns relatively slowly. Uh, Methane burns relatively fast, but it's, uh, shall we say, it's a controllable burn speed. Hydrogen burns hypersonically fast, super fast. So one of the things a fuel nozzle is trying to do is inject fuel into the airstream so that it's blown downstream and mixing before it actually starts to burn. So getting that sort of downstream distance from the actual physical fuel nozzle, which you don't want to overheat and burn, and the flame ball, there may be some number of centimeters or inches in there, and matching those speeds is a bit of a challenge. Uh, sometimes there's orifices or other mechanical tools that help do that. It's going to be very interesting as we start burning high hydrogen volumes to see what that does to combustors, because controlling that standoff distance is going to be more and more difficult. 
And I think that's going to be a challenge going forward. Moving downstream a little bit in the combustor here, we're looking at a combustion liner, sometimes called a basket, um, in some of the larger uh, Alstom machines, it would be called zone one or zone two, um, combustion inner liner, there's a bunch of different names. But the point is, this is an area where extra dilution and cooling air comes in and mixes with the combustion. And the, the fuel nozzles injected here, you typically have a lot of high recirculation areas because you want the flame to recirculate back and ignite the new fuel coming in. So you've got continuous combustion and then you want to dilute it and then pass it down a pipe and into so-called transition piece that takes that flow and distributes it around the turbine. One of the things that's going to be a failure point here is all of these joints and holes and contours can be areas where the material is weak or the structure is weak and they're going to be prone to, you know, overheating, bending, creep, um, and, you know, coming out of shape, shall we say. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting in a combustor is when you think about this, this turbulence area that by definition keeps the continuous burning occurring, that area there releases noise, right? It's moving air, it's rarefied and high pressure air that's, that's oscillating, and it is by definition acoustical noise. And one of the challenges that we have in modern um, high dilution or, or so-called lean premix type combustors is when we mix in a lot of that air, we get a burn front that, that occurs, that rarefies the air, changes the, changes the sound velocity, uh, creates a sound wave that bounces off the wall comes back into the flame and that sound wave traveling through the flame changes the, the burn rate. So you get this feedback loop. And if you get all of your sums wrong, you can have a situation where what you're doing is you're, you basically created a tuba that's resonating at a resonant frequency and the combustor hums. Um, that's a huge problem because that acoustical noise is shaking that, that pipe. And that pipe is relatively thin sheet metal. In most industrial combustors, it's one, two, three, four millimeters thick. And so it's sheet metal and it's vibrating and it's bending and it's fatiguing and leading to cracks and other problems. Plus all of the attachment points and feed throughs are now rubbing and they're wearing out. So there's a lot of damage that can occur when these parts resonate. Um, and you can literally hear it. The way to protect yourself from that is an instrument that basically is a microphone that listens for the frequencies. And when it hears it resonating, you make a change to the fuel flow or the airflow or the airflow distribution to sort of squelch that, uh, that noise. Um, I was fortunate enough to be standing beside a 1950s vintage jet once when it started up and its afterburner uh, started resonating. And I could not believe the energy of that thing shaking me standing, you know, four, five, six meters away. Um, just an enormous amount of acoustical energy can be generated and quite quickly too. So what does that do? Well, there's a really good example of something gone off the rails on a combustor. So if you've got any hot spots, they can burn the material. If there's a coating, they can burn out the material. If the, da if the parts are are vibrating, you can get wear, you can get cracking, you can get fracture. Um, and if you've got the resonance, you, this can happen in like literally just a few hours. Um, and here's a combustion basket here that's vibrated itself into two pieces uh, uh, because of that problem. The picture that's shown over here shows some wear associated with the, the outlet hula seals. Uh, again, that's a hard face material and it's just been worn out by the vibration something to look out for. Here's another sort of uh, set of pictures here associated with some damage from combustor sections. We're seeing cracking in a transition piece here, uh, cracking in a, a strut for a, a fuel nozzle alignment and swirler assembly here. Uh, here we're seeing, uh, I think that's a side seal and you can see that the material is worn right away. That material is probably three to four millimeters, a quarter of an inch or so thick, maybe not a quarter, uh, three eighths, um, sorry, um, 
an eighth of an inch thick or thereabouts, and it's 100% worn away and uh, uh, from the action of the vibration. Here we can see a hot spot inside a combust uh, transition piece here, burning away the coating, and here's another attachment area where there's some heavy duty wear occurring. These are all pretty common failure modes. Uh, some more failure modes here. Um, here's a combustion uh, transition piece here. And again, you can see the FPI has lined out a series of cracks associated from, again, vibration of that component. Uh, here's a hot spot leading to thermal barrier coating loss, burning it out. Once the base metal is exposed, then it burns even faster, and that creates trouble. Um, cracking in a series of holes here, cracking through a body here. So these are all common failure modes. So that's what I've got at least initially to say about combustor failures and fuel nozzle failures. Uh, let's see if there's any questions that we can answer associated with those types of components before we move on to the turbine. Uh, we've got one question for you, Doug. Um, in combustors, is carbon clinker release and impact damage common? Uh, carbon clinker. Okay, if you're running heavy oil, uh, you have a much greater chance of creating carbon than methane, for example. And I have seen carbon buildup on fuel nozzles. I think most commonly the carbon builder, the carbon will build up on the fuel nozzle. Um, if you've got a dual fuel machine, one of the classics is you shut off the liquid fuel and you don't blow the line out. And then that residual fuel cokes inside the line. And where I'm going with this is once that happens, then the next time you use the liquid fuel, you no longer get the distribution and atomization that you were hoping for, and you can very easily get hot spots leading to cracking and failure. That I have seen fairly common. In terms of carbon building up and then being released and becoming an impact risk downstream, that's a much less common thing. I can't say that I've seen much of it, um, not in turbines. Um, so I can't say that I've seen a lot of that, but it's it's perceivable. It's it's possible that a lump of carbon could hit something and break it. But carbon's a pretty light, pretty friable material, so I don't think that's a real strong possibility. Okay, and uh, just um, what is the impact of water injection flow? On in the combustor and downstream components. Okay, well, okay, water injections typically put into control NOx. It, it helps to quench the flame and drop the NOx signal, signal down. It's also used for extra thrust on flight engines. What the water does is it in, increases the mass flow through the gas turbine. If you've got a gas turbine that is sensitive to high mass flow resonance situations, um, the old LM6000 PAs, for example, were sensitive to this. You can get vibration of the airfoils and cracking um, uh, under high mass flow conditions. The other thing that water can do is it increases the heat transfer, uh, sorry, it increases the heat capacity of the combustion gas, and that can lead to high heat loads onto cooled components, and those high heat loads can lead to burning and and damage of the cooled components. Okay, and just quickly, um, do you know off the top of your head the exact title of the book you referenced before uh, on failure analysis? The ASM? Yeah, it's on the bottom of my presentation. It's the ASM Metals Handbook Failure Analysis uh, Volume. And to be honest, I don't know the volume number off the top of my head. And uh, one of my coworkers, Kevin Weens, has done a really nice job of doing a rotating equipment failures uh, chapter in there. Okay, great. Um, I guess we can move on. Okay. Looking at the gas turbine section uh, and what's again the design basis for failure. Over the years, a lot of different materials have been put into gas turbines and the goal has always been to raise temperature or to allow higher temperatures. So you may recognize some of these materials in your more modern machines here that operate at fairly high metal temperatures. Um, hand in hand with improving materials capability, the design of turbine blades has 
evolved uh, immeasurably over the years from solid blades to straight through cooling holes to cavity holes to film uh, and, and, and re-entrant serpentine type cooling passages and then prime reliant on coatings. So there's been a whole lot of manufacturing process evolution as well to make engines as efficient. So the trick is these very expensive, very specialized alloys and these very specialized manufacturing processes can lead to potential failure mechanisms. All right. Uh, so basically, we've got high temperature requirements. Those require complex processes. And because the processes are complex, there's all sorts of defect modes that can occur. Operation is very sensitive to these defects. Um, and the stress patterns are very complex. So here we have a picture of a turbine blade and you can see there's all kinds of cooling holes associated with it, all sorts of contours. These walls may be only one, one and a half millimeters thick. They're very, very thin. So the temperature distribution of a cooled blade is not uniform. So these cool areas here are under compression, so to speak, or, or at least retaining, I should say, the hot sections. So these hot nose and hot trailing edges are being constrained by the core of the blade. So there's a lot of stress building up inside this blade as it, as it fights itself. Uh, the hot areas are fighting the cold areas to try and set the length of the blade. And that can cause a lot of problems, thermal fatigue problems. As well, just making the parts can create all sorts of problems as well. There can be incompatibilities between coatings and alloys. There can be segregation, in other words, in non-uniform mixing of the alloy itself. Um, there can be porosity inside the alloy here. It's a really good example here of a lot of porosity inside a cast airfoil. That was a root of a failure. Here's a picture of a single crystal blade showing all these various different metallurgical damages that can occur during the casting process that can lead to trouble. And here's one here that we do see from time to time that people maybe don't appreciate. Sometimes during the manufacturing, parts can be reworked. So what we've got here is we've got a weld buried inside this, uh, this piece of airfoil here. That was a piece of vein airfoil. It had been weld repaired during the manufacturing process to try and lower the cost of manufacturing. And that led to a problem that led to a failure. So all these processes are susceptible to problems. But one of the most common operational problems that we see is cooling air related problems. So here are some examples of cooling failures or cooling system failures. We've got here, you know, obviously TVC that's fallen off of this vein segment here. And what's happening is you're starting to get thermal fatigue cracks in the hot areas or oxidation cracks um, where the coating has been lost. More subtly here we see some cooling holes. And if you look real closely, you should be able to see that that cooling hole is plugged. Some piece of dirt or debris has gotten in there, typically from the cold side towards the hot side. These uh, cooled airfoils, they act just like strainers. So any dirt that gets inside gets strained and get held inside and that creates hot spots that can lead to cracking. Here's again a series of plugged cooling holes and you can see that the uh, material is overheated here and started to peel back the TVC because of it. More subtly, here's, a cop here's an example of a cooled airfoil cross-section through a cooling hole and you can see the cooling hole is supposed to exit at a certain angle and bleed cold air over the surface, therefore keeping it cold but because of the coating process, it's completely changed the angle. And now the cooling air, instead of forming film cooling adjacent to the surface, it's inadvertently shooting out into the main gas flow and not doing its job. So cooling systems can break down fairly regularly. Okay. Um, so some of the systematic design deficiencies, sort of in summary here, uh, designing and building turbines is a compromise. The OEM's point of view is always trying to lower the cost of the material, the cost of the process, but maintain the performance. Um, and so you can get variability because of complex processing systems, um, and that can result in poor durability or poor service life, um, which is usually accounted for in design margin, but not always. Um, so we're always looking at trying to lower the cost of manufacturing, we're looking for simpler geometries for better manufacturing. 
we're trying to use robust processes with known materials that we can understand and so on. Um, always trying to automate the processes, take the worker out so that we eliminate the worker's errors. Okay. Um, automation can do things precisely wrong too. Um, one of the tricks in the turbine industry that's always interesting and sometimes comes up in failure analysis is the use of proprietary materials and processes. Typically, an OEM, in order to protect their sort of technological home ground, they will uh, use patented alloys or patented coating compositions or patented processes to try and restrict non OEM or at least other OEMs, other manufacturers from making duplicate parts and, and underselling them. So that's a challenge. And then sometimes that causes them to use inappropriate materials like not the best coatings in the world, but we use it because it's our coating, right? So that comes up in failures from time to time. So they, the designers have to use certain technologies or signature design features to try and protect their own ground. Um, another area where there can be systematic problems is design scaling. Uh, you know, we know the frame three and five are sort of scale up engines from one another. The frame six, seven, nine, same thing, they're scales up. Uh, Westinghouse did the same in the 501 and the Mitsubishi 701. Alstom did the same in 24, 26, and Siemens did the, did the same. So once you've got a good design, you try and scale it up and scale it down to come out with a broader range of product. But sometimes those design scaling rules break down and cause problems. Right. Here's an example of a systematic design deficiency here. Um, what the manufacturer is trying to do is drill all these cooling holes in the most efficient, cost-effective way, and so they chose to draw, drill them all in a straight line. Well, not surprisingly, that straight line created a plane of weakness or a line of weakness. The part would vibrate, and then you would get fracture along the line of holes. So they had to change the design and come to this sort of zigzaggy hole method to prevent that from happening. So again, back to that statement I made earlier, and I wish I owned it, I don't. Can't remember who told it to me. Sometimes the OEM will sell as an upgrade what they should have done properly in the first place. And I'm sure that this part here was sold as an upgraded high durability transition piece, whereas the original <laughs> was, was obsoleted. Um, here's another example of the design scale challenge. Um, this is a turbine blade here, cross section. You can see the cooling holes through it. Um, so the OEM, scaled a successful design to try, in this case, make a bit smaller engine, uh, but reusing as much of the design data as possible. But the problem is not all the physical phenomena uh, scale linearly. You can scale the size linearly, but the heat transfer does not scale linearly. Um, so the positioning of the holes was not correct in terms of distributing the, the cooling air. Um, similarly, manufacturing processes have hard limits. If you take a design and you try and scale it down, there may be a minimum hole size that you can drill. And so that may be a hard limit. So as a result, the resulting uh, blade had a hot spot on the trailing edge and that caused cracking at the trailing edge, creep failures. So what was happening is the part had to be redesigned. They used a more castable alloy and a non-proprietary coating system to try and protect the trailing edge, redistributed the cooling holes to get more uniform temperatures, um, and that lowered the strains and, and made a more successful part. So some of the environmental constraints, um, we often reshape parts to improve manufacturability and that can create problems. We sometimes see substitution of shorter processing cycles uh, particularly manufacturers that, that cut heat treatments down to absolute minimum and therefore don't necessarily achieve the strengthening that they're looking for in a heat treatment, uh, minimizing of holes and joints and so on, leading to problems like that combustor where all the holes are, are not the right size or not the right placement, I should say, um, replacement of materials and coating processes. Um, becomes, a, becomes again, a, a, anywhere there's a change, there's a ch chance for failure. Now, some of the changes are fundamentally well and very well intentioned, such as eliminating dangerous processing techniques, getting rid of manual operations that are dangerous, like thermal spraying, 
getting rid of uh, certain types of radiography that can be dangerous or complying with environmental laws. Those are again, good things trying to get. You know, if you're trying to get the molybda, I'm sorry, trying to get. Uh, um, dangerous materials out of the engine for cadmium, for example, taking cadmium off of compressors and what have you. Um, in some instances, certain materials are what they call conflict minerals. For example, tantalum is a conflict mineral. So one of the manufacturers made a big campaign of taking tantalum out of their alloys so that they did not have to uh, prove that all of their minerals were not conflict minerals. Um, that was great, lowered the cost of the alloy and they were able to sell a whole bunch of new parts with this new improved alloy that from my perspective wasn't necessarily new or improved. It just was deleting a conflict mineral. So all of these things can sort of lead to less than ideal components being manufactured. Um, really classic example here is, you know, getting rid of solvents in paints leads to this sort of problem like we have on this car here. And we can have the same thing on turbine parts. If there's dirt or contamination on the surface and we haven't cleaned it properly, we can have a problem with coating not sticking in the engine. So let's look at some of the operational factors that cause failures. Um, and the number one cause of turbine failures is operation. I mean, if you don't operate your engine, you're not gonna fail it. And of course, if my speed limit on my street is zero, I'm not gonna have car crashes. Okay, it's illogical, but <laughs> it's the reality, you gotta operate. Um, so the trick with operation is there's a large number of interlinked systems that must function together. And that's difficult to do, especially on a modern machine. All of those functions need to be within normal parameters. And you've got control systems that need to start and synchronize all these things and make sure that different devices are speaking to each other. And all that data needs to be monitored and interpreted. And it's too complex for a single operator to, to do that. So you've got hundreds of main parameters and thousands of peripheral parameters in the typical gas turbine plant, and they all need to be controlled and synchronized so you have automated controls. They're a necessity and a data log that tells you what's going on to record all your events and all your trends. And hopefully you've got teams of technicians and operators who know how to observe, test, and interpret all this data. Um, that's not always the case, I've found. Um, so what's really important is that operators need to understand how their operating system works and remain diligent for when things go off the rail and catch them as soon as possible. You need to know when things are not normal and you need to analyze your trends regularly. Don't wait for there to be a failure before you start pulling out your historian data and looking for, well, was the temperature rising? Was the compressor air dropping? You know, you got to do that regularly. And if you spot those trends going off the rails, that's your opportunity to prevent a failure, turns a failure into a near miss, right? One of the challenges of automated controls is they're fast and precise, but are they really accurate, right? Some parameters are not really measured. They're calculated based on remote signals. The classic one is firing temperature. The, you measure your exit guide temperature at the back end of your engine, then you use a computer model to say, okay, if it was this temperature here, what would it take to, to create that temperature up here in the combustor? Up in the combustor is where it matters, where the failure is going to occur. And you're relying on not only that signal being accurate in the thermal couple at the trail at the outlet end, but you're relying on the aerodynamics flow through the turbine and the various models that are built into that control system being accurate to get a good idea of what the firing temperature is. And that's always a challenge, especially in upset conditions. All right. Um, another thing to be aware of is the limits of transducers. Sometimes transducers will peg at a certain value. Uh, the Chernobyl was a classic example where their radiation de detector pegged at so many thousand, uh, so many thousand rem that was below a level of concern, or at least not dire concern. So people didn't understand how much radiation was escaping because the instrument was simply pegged. All right. Um, Another thing is to be aware of what I call digital digitized accuracy. When people see a digital number with three significant figures, they tend to believe it more than when they see an old fashioned pointer on a gauge. But in many cases, sometimes those significant digits are just random numbers. So beware of that bias. You know, the old line that 
if it's on the internet, if they've got a curve, it must be true. If they've got a graph, it must be true. Not necessarily true. So you've got to understand the, the models and you need to be able to interpret what the models are telling you and look for corroborating evidence. In other words, if your model is saying that your temperatures are high, look for other evidence that would be consistent with that high temperature. For example, you might see extra output that you didn't expect to have. Okay, that probably means that you're overfiring. Um, higher speeds, that may mean that you're overfiring. That sort of thing. And beware of missing or corrupted signals, you know. A lot of times an uh, exit thermal couple will go south and people will just lock it out and say, well, I've got eight other ones, so, uh, so we'll just run with it. Um, sometimes there's a reason why those things have fallen out and it bears more investigation. So those are sort of the control aspects of things. If you look at control systems and failures um, and automated controls, particularly when you're upgrading controls, these are some statistics that were collected in the UK, and they found that almost half of the control system failures were because the specification was wrong. The computer was told to do the wrong thing. Um, to a lesser extent, uh, changes after commissioning, in other words, the system wasn't set up properly, um, and to a lesser extent, operations and maintenance and so on. So for control systems, getting them, telling them to do the right things, super, super important. Um, and that dovetails nicely into procedural errors. Um, if there's un insufficient understanding of the complete system and all of the interactions, there can be problems. And that's where, you know, you say, okay, a certain seal has failed and you may not understand that when that's, seal fails it draws extra cooling air or extra lubricating oil from and starves other components so that's a challenge you need to understand the complete system um, inattention to monitors and alarms you need to know what to do and doing it quickly uh, just silencing alarm isn't necessarily solving a problem um, this is a big one here allowing commercial pressures to override procedures everybody's under pressure to produce nowadays while well, they have for a long time um, so an alarm goes off and it's really tempting to press the silence button and maybe not do a, a full investigation, maybe not do a shutdown when you should. Um, and even when you do a shutdown, delayed corrective and maintenance actions are a huge problem. Commercial pressures say you're doing a combustion inspection. You go down on a Friday night, you take the engine apart on Saturday. Saturday night you find some cracked parts and then you have to make a decision on Sunday. Well, do we put it back together or do we stay down for the five days it's going to take to get the replacement part? Well, your boss is saying get the engine back up and online. So you typically will say, okay, put the crack part back in and we'll start up Monday morning because Monday morning is the day we're supposed to start up and promise the utility we'd be available. Well, the whole point of doing a combustion inspection or any inspection for that matter is to find these problems and correct them. So if you delay or or refuse a maintenance action just because it's going to interfere with your schedule, you're asking for, for problems there. Um, going down the list here, there's a, there's a whole laundry list of problems, and, and we'll make this stuff available to you uh, in a PDF later. Um, effective communications is a really, really important one. So people know what's going on, what the control room is seeing versus what the person out on the deck might be seeing. Uh, versus what the business people are expecting. Um, that's all got to be coordinated and effective communication is a, is a root of a lot of failures. Um, and then one of the last ones here I've got down here underlined here is reacting to the symptom of an upset instead of correcting the cause. So a real simple example would be if you start to see, um, you know, hot corrosion scale deposits building up on turbine parts and you scrape them off during a combustion inspection and you keep running, if you don't stop the dirt from coming in, you're just going to get more dirt. And if that dirt's corrosive, you're going to have a corrosion failure. So you can't just react to the symptom and clean the part. You need to go further and say, OK, what was on the part? Let's collect some of those pieces that we cleaned off, chemically analyze them, find out what they are. Once we know what they are, we got a good chance to find out where they came from. And we can go find out how to stop that from happening, stop that material from coming in. So that's a really important message there. Um, talked about this sort of concept about monitoring and data analysis. There's a lot of material or a lot of data that's collected by modern control systems. 
And it's one of the first tools that people look at after the failure. In other words, the machine goes bang in the night and people download all the data and they start looking and they go, oh yeah, look at the vibration five days ago started to go up. Oh yeah, look at the compressor delivery pressure was going down five days before the event. It really should be the tool that you're using to predict the failure and prevent the failure. So it's important to use that tool and to get used to operating it and interpreting it. Um, that's really, really important, I think. In terms of a growth area for turbine control systems, this predictive uh, and, and advanced corrective actions, um, so-called dynamic maintenance. Um, some people call it digital twinning, right? Where you've got a computer model of your plant and your computer model is predicting what your maintenance needs are going to be and what your failure is coming up. Um, you know, if you're a fan of uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 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 movies, you know the, how the computer said that the RF-39 unit was going to go belly up in 24 hours or whatever it was. Um, you know, that, that machine predicted that failure. Um, ironically, it predicted it wrong in that particular case. But uh, that's, that's the idea behind these digital twins. All right. So one of the problems that I see in both long-term service agreements and digital twinning is this last point here. Um, operators, owners sometimes feel they can lead out their operational staff, right? They say, okay, I've got a computer, so I don't necessarily need three operators. I can make do with two or one. Um, they may say, look, I've got a long-term service agreement, so I don't need to do preventative maintenance because my LTSA will cover it. Um, no, it won't. Um, so sometimes these tools create a situation where operators become dependent on monitoring and they lose expertise on their own system um, and they take a more laissez-faire point of view um, and they're not doing the maintenance things that they should. And we see a fair number of failures associated with operators who have lost, uh, lost control of their system for those reasons. Okay, so that kind of brings us to maintenance factors. Um, and then, you know, all different engines have different expected lifetimes, but they all are generally intended to have regularly scheduled maintenance. The exception might be, a, you know, a gas turbine that's pushing a cruise missile or something like that. All of them have maintenance intervals, and they might be 12,000 hours, they might be 50,000 hours, or somewhere in between. They might be starts-based or a combination of the two, you know, uh, 20,000 hours or 1,000 starts or whichever comes first sort of thing. Some OEMs, in fact, most OEMs have some kind of equivalent operating hours or factored hours or something like that that help equivalent starts to hours so that you can come up with one number and plan maintenance around that. And one thing that a lot of people tend to forget here is liquid fuels typically reduce maintenance intervals by about a factor of two. Um, so that's something to definitely look out for. Um, one of the, I, get, I mentioned this before, the deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance is a huge red flag for me because it consumes safety margin, right? And if two things go wrong and your safety margin is used up, bang, you're going to have trouble. Modern gas turbines are very complex machines. And because they're complex, they are not tolerant of upsets or changes. Um, so things have to work just tickety boo. I think if you looked at the, you know, the old 1970s vintage machines, you could probably throw a handful of gravel into the compressor and it would grind its way through, but the engine would still run. There's no way a modern engine would do that. So when you defer maintenance, you consume that safety margin and you tend to accumulate damage. In other words, the damage keeps occurring. The cracks keep, keep growing. The walls keep burning thinner and thinner, possibly beyond repair and maybe even to the point of failure. So deferred maintenance, huge red flag for me. All right. Um, one of the challenges of a lot of these maintenance plans is that the typical OEM operating instructions are indeed fleet-wide estimates. In other words, they do tend to be conservative. And the reason is the OEM has to you know, protect their reputation and their warranty. So they're going to be conservative. So people do tend to know this and they do tend to break the rules from time to time. You'll even see the OEMs breaking their own you know, maintenance rules 
uh, from time to time. So again, if you understand the systems, it's not so much a red flag, but it's something to be aware of. Um, one of the key things here is special circumstances um, can change those maintenance interviews. Uh, I mentioned liquid fuels, but even bad quality air, um, operation with misaligned rotors and so on and so forth can all drastically affect the expected maintenance life and therefore the runtime to failure, right? So again, one of the ideas of real-time monitoring is to track this damage accumulation, uh, you know, again, through things like digital models, uh, digital twinning, as long as they have sensors to detect the actual condition of the part at this time. So here's a plot here. For example, this plot is showing uh, actual fired hours and equivalent hours here, and the OEM's maintenance manual would give some kind of straight line uh, damage accumulation model saying, you know, you do need to do repairs at 24,000 hours. For example, if you had an actual model and you track the damage real time based on actual temperature of the part, you may find a curve that's something like this, where the damage accumulates quite quickly initially, but then the damage rate tends to fall off. And if you do this accurately, you can often get more service life out of a component than what the engine manual would say. But beware, under certain conditions, this curve might continue up here and you might have a shorter life. So the advantage of these systems is to track that life and to make those maintenance decisions before there's a failure, All right? Any questions about this before we move on? Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, have you seen TBC spallation due to small amounts of alkaline metals in the air? Uh, t I've seen lots of TBC spallations, impact being probably the number one in terms of premature spalling. Uh, at end of life, it's just the bond coat burning out. So having said that, anything that burns the bond coat out faster, such as uh, anything that causes hot corrosion, like alkali salts, yes, does tend to lower TBC life. Now, what I have found in some of our studies is when the salts deposit on the very surface of the TBC, it is significantly hotter and they re-evaporate off without actually soaking down into the into the bond coat area and causing damage. So if you're lucky, you're hot enough that you're above the dew temperature of the salt and you're not going to get the corrosion. Now, having said that, if you think about a turbine airfoil, it's hot in the middle, it's cooler towards the edges, and therefore you could get a whole range of temperatures and you might be protected in the middle because of re-evaporation, but not protected at the edges. So does that make sense? <laughs> I think so. Um, can you address failures in turbine NGV or blade repairs from NGV diffusion braze or blade tip weld repairs? Okay, so both of those methods that you've talked about there are methods of adding new metal where metal has been lost, typically. Um, so on a blade tip, if it rubs against the casing, we'll often go in there and we'll weld a new blade tip or, or, or raise the, the tip to reestablish the seal. On a turbine vein, we'll get a thermal fatigue crack and we'll often go in there and weld or sometimes raise to heal that crack. So if I understand you correctly, you're asking, are there failures associated with that process? Absolutely. And in the next section of this chapter, we're going we're gonna to definitely look at that. And fundamentally, I think the easiest way to think about this is, and this is a real generalization. Generally speaking, welds are not as strong as the parent material. Generally speaking, brazes are not as strong as the parent material, or certainly not as ductile as the parent material. So whatever caused the parent material to crack, whatever stresses and strains those were, likely they're going to also crack the weld or crack the braze. That's a real huge generalization. And I know there's a lot of repair people that would say, but wait, you know, you can't generalize it like that. But that's the generalization that I'll make. And then I will say that it is safe to use these processes in relatively low stress areas, in damage tolerant areas, um, and for 
safe maintenance intervals. So they're effective and they're cost effective ways of dealing with damage to allow more life out of a component and therefore uh, more economical operations of the engine. That's not a, they're not a fundamental problem, but you do need to use them appropriately. Okay, so let's look at the concept of design migration, and I think then we'll get into the repair sort of side of things. Um, design migration, typically new technology gets put into older engines, right? Design features migrate from, from what's proven on the new engines into the older engines. Sometimes they upgrade the whole darn engine, frame 7E becomes a frame 7F, becomes a frame 7H, that sort of thing. Sometimes it's just an upgrade kit. The firing temperature gets raised from you know, 2100 to 2150 or 2175 or whatever. Um, sometimes an OEM ceases to manufacture the original part. So if you've got an older engine, sometimes you've got a mixed bag of parts. You might have a, you know, um, row one or row two blades or veins that are a newer design than the, your, your, your row three, your row four, row, row five. And sometimes that mix or match situation creates an overall engine that's out of balance, not necessarily compatible with itself. So you have to look out for that as a potential failure mode when you've got older design parts mixed in with new design parts. Um, for Alstom operators that might have GT13 E2s, you know, you're familiar with the 1 5th, 2 5th, 3 5th uh, MXL, where you replace one stage at a time. Well, you can find yourself overworking those older parts if you're assuming the engine is capable of all the new, that the new parts can do. So you have to watch out for that. You also have to watch out for fits and clearances, especially if shapes change. Um, if you happen to have a GE machine, you might know that from time to time GE puts out new blade and vein shapes. You know, they sometimes call them arrow shapes or whatever. They have different fits and clearances, so you can't put an arrow vein in front of a non arrow blade or bucket in GE speak. So you, again, you've got to watch your fits and clearances. There can be changes to cooling airflow. There can be changes to firing points and so on and so forth. So the bottom line is that mixed sets of parts can be incompatible, both mechanically and in terms of durability and in terms of repairability. Um, so those can be sources of failures. That's sort of design migration. Okay, so this brings us to the concept of repair fa uh, factors. Um, and when it comes to repair, everybody, the reason we repair is we want to keep the engines running, running well, and we want to lower costs. And the number one cost for most plants, in fact, all plants, is going to be fuel. So you can't control the price of fuel. It's often set, you know, uh, whatever the barrel of price of oil is this week. Um, so you try to eliminate operational costs, you try to eliminate or minimize maintenance costs, which means maintenance repair price costs with repairs. So typically a repair will cost somewhere between 10 and probably about 30 or 40 percent of a new part. So if you can repair it and get it back in service, you've saved a fair amount of money. And at a million dollars a row uh, of airfoils, you can save a lot of money. But the problem with modern engines is high efficiency comes with the price tag of complexity and complexity is less tolerant of errors and upsets, right? There's lots of potential manufacturing problems and therefore there's lots of material or sorry, repair process problems that can be introduced and we have to watch out for that. A lot of these parts have very expensive and specialized material and we have to be aware that what we maybe would have done in terms of welding or heat treating last year maybe doesn't apply to the modern engines. If you've got a GT4, uh, I'm sorry, a GT24 or a GT26, you've got single crystals. Single crystals do not respond well to heat treatment, so that really ties our hands behind our back in terms of repair technologies for those types of parts. So here's a real simple example of a repair. This happens to be a steam valve, but a plain carbon valve uh, was working fine, but the problem is when it wasn't working, it was corroding and had a lot of scale in it. So they decided to weld up the, the seat faces with uh, 
uh, triple alloy material, took care of the wear problems and the scaling, but the problem is it was very brittle and introduced a, a cracking mode of failure. So you got to watch out that your repair isn't going to change your failure mode from something that you knew to something that you didn't know. So repair, um, I think I've said this stuff here. Uh, we're trying to manage and optimize our maintenance activity. Um, typically, we look to the OEM for our first instructions, um, and then we look to repair history. What else have we done with this engine or with this fleet, right? Um, one really useful source of information is what I call a life analysis or a metallurgical analysis of used components. If you take a used component and you look at it metallurgically, you can tell a whole bunch of thing about, things about what the damage modes are, how far along those damage modes are between, you know, pristine and failure. Um, and sometimes you can find things out that say something about the operational condition. You know, you might find deposits or erosion that may point back to a filter house type problem. So all of those sorts of things can be found out by doing a metallurgical analysis. Um, now you can find a lot of those things out from a failure analysis as well, but obviously it's too little too late. <laughs> One of the things you can find out from a life analysis is again a, a concept of upgrading the components. If you do find you've got a corrosion problem, maybe you want to introduce a coating or use a better coating. Um, and look at applying things like prognostic models, in other words, predictive models. All right. So the bottom line here is once you know the damage modes, you can target your repair actions. If parts are burning, you got to make sure that you deal with that burning, but that you somehow make them burn proof going forward, a better alloy, a better coating or whatever. And so knowing the damage modes is important. Some damage modes are predictable and repeatable. Um, some are not. Hidden damage is especially challenging. And one of the classics is things like plug cooling holes that you can't see on the outside of a part. So what we're typically looking for repair is a longevity of the parts. So replacement of life limited parts. We may do that periodically. We may use on condition or we may run until there's a reason to repair. OK, the most critical parts are typically the hot section parts. They're the most expensive as well. So that's where the big bang for a buck is in terms of repair. Um, I don't really want to belittle or, or at least spend a, a lot of time looking at, uh, at, at repair issues from a design point of view. We'll, we'll hand this stuff out. But one of the key things I do want to say is that repairs are basically early repair or all parts are designed with a safety margin and very early repairs back in the 60s and 70s simply consumed a safety margin. Um, more aggressive repairs started to use special processes to reverse the damage. And then the more elaborate repairs not only reverse the damage, but they make the part more fortified so that the damage does not reoccur or recurs at a slower rate. And that's what I call repair engineering. And that's a skill all its own. And that's different from the skill of designing a part. And because I come from a repair company, I'll make this statement. Just because you designed a turbine part doesn't mean you know how to best repair it. All right, I'll let you guys flame it from there. So here's some examples of some bad repairs that can lead to failures. Um, defects that have been over blended. So this part's been blended to death and <laughs> blends in areas that are high stress like that. Not necessarily a good idea. Here's a blade tip that's been weld repaired, but the wrong filler alloy was used and the weld alloy burned away. What's really ironic is that the coating is standing up and showing where the alloy would have been had it not burned away. Um, and then here's a weld where the weld metal uh, had all kinds of weld defects and cracks that burned away in service as well. So you can get problems with repairs that can lead to failures. No question about it. Probably one of the most common repair related failures is welding in inappropriate locations. If you think about a turbine blade, it's spinning on the turbine wheel or, or disc. So it has a very, very high stress at the bottom and a decreasing stress towards the tip. If the tip strikes the shroud and wears out or bends, you can cut the tip off and you can weld that back. 
if you stay within, you know, a centimeter or two or, or less than an inch of the tip where the stresses are low, knock yourself out. You can do that. Not a problem. But when you start welding further down the airfoil where the stresses are high, the problem is that the weld material doesn't have the strength of the parent material. Even if it's parent material weld filler, it doesn't necessarily have the same microstructure. And therefore, a weld in that area there can definitely lead to things like a crack. And you can see the weld deposit. You can see a crack coming out of it. And that's basically just a, a creep crack happening that would lead to a failure ultimately. So welding in inappropriate areas. Another classic is welding below the shroud of a shrouded blade. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's a shrouded blade where the shrouds broken off. When we look at the surface metallurgically, we can see weld deposits where there shouldn't be any. Um, and uh, inappropriate weld alloy on top of that. So again, welding where you shouldn't is a huge failure mode. Here's some more challenging welds here. This is a, in a, this is a weld that has lack of fusion. In other words, they haven't melted the two surfaces together properly, leaving a chain of holes. You can imagine that that's going to cut the strength down dramatically. Here's a weld where there's been no control of what the welder's been doing. He's probably been welding, he or she, the welder's been welding. The, the thermal strains on the part have caused the part to crack. So the welder's just chasing that crack all over the airfoil and making a heck of a mess. Um, here's a unmatched filler welds, two different filler welds that didn't necessarily jive together and cracked. And here's a crack that's buried underneath the coating. Um, in other words, the crack wasn't blended out and properly repaired. So there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in a weld or, and in a repair that can cause problems. One of the classics that we see is internal coating uh, deficiencies. A lot of modern parts are coated on the inside. So it's very common during repair to strip and recoat on the outside. So here's a external coating. Um, but here the internal coating has not been renewed. So this part's going to burn from the inside out. Now, some people will say, Doug, well, why would it burn from the inside? The inside's cooling air. Well, remember the source of that cooling air is compressor delivery air. And that's typically around 400 Celsius, 800 degrees Fahrenheit in round numbers. Um, and so it's literally capable of burning the material just at a slower rate. But if you don't know it's burning on the inside and you're not doing anything to replace that internal coating, then eventually you'll get a failure from the inside out. And that's real hard to inspect for. So that's a, a, a real problem lurking in the background. All right. So what do we want to look for in terms of repair and refurbishment? We want to look at properly engineered repairs that don't consume safety margin, right? You want to weld with super alloys, not solid solution filters. Um, if you're using brazing repairs, you want to look at wide gap repairs for TMF cracking. You, you know, um, they, you want to look at ductility of those brazes in particular. And then if you're good, your advanced repair can return parts like new. Uh, so that they can run a full maintenance interval with no deficit at all. Uh, that typically involves rejuvenation heat treatments to re-strengthen the material, replacement of the coatings, uh, weld repairing, coupon repairing, whatever. If you're talking about combustion parts, turbine nozzles, you'll often disassemble them and remanufacture them uh, so they're good as new. And then in the repair industry, upgrades and modifications are situations where you can do something during the repair process to not only repair the damage, but to make the part more robust so that the damage does not reoccur or reoccurs at a slower rate. Very classically, one of the easy things to do is to add coatings or to substitute better coatings than the original. Um, do things like change throat areas and veins uh, to, to maintain the efficiency of the machine. Um, change cooling air distribution to eliminate hot spots and cold spots, um, adding anti-wear coatings. These are all things that can make parts better than new. Some examples here, um, a fuel nozzle here from a, a EV burner type lance, and it tends to wear out. So if I replace this portion of the barrel here with an anti-wear material, I can get much longer life on that fuel nozzle. So not only is it repair, but it's a, it's a better part 
here's a uh, combustion liner here. It's odd. Um, I'm sorry. Here's a turbine blade here. It tends to burn down at the tip. So we go in there and we weld in a new material in the tip and we add an antioxidation material so we don't get that failure happening again. So really, really uh, kind of simple in concept, but a little trickier in, in, in execution. There was a question about braze repairs. Here's an example of a high ductility braze repair that's been executed on an F-class fuel no or F-class uh, nozzle vit guide vane. And this is a part that has been run in service, cracked, repaired, run in service a second time, and then the coating has been stripped off and has been etched. And what you can see is you can see the prior repair here, and you can see the new cracks that are occurring adjacent to, um, again, a prior repair and the new crack adjacent to the repair. So what this is telling me is that the part is as good as new, right? Because it's cracked in the high strain areas, just like a brand new, the brand new part did. So we haven't changed the temperature distribution, so that's going to happen. But the repair has been sufficiently ductile that it's not preferentially cracked in the prior repair. So that's quite useful, is uh, a good quality, uh, high integrity repair. Okay, so that brings us to the concept of inspection during repair processes or manufacture for that matter. Um, all materials in the gas turbine must be high quality, right? And what's really interesting about gas turbines is there's a lot of manual, shall we say, craftsmanship that goes into them, as opposed to automotive parts, where there's a lot of automation and high volume. Um, so there's lots of inspections to be done. Um, one of the key things from a failure analysis point of view is you want to look at the calibration of the inspection tools to see if they were calibrated or did somebody make a mistake because they were, you know, reading a bad number. So you need to look at the calipers and gauges and thermocouples and so on and assembly jigs to make sure that they're calibrated. Most shops will have this stuff calibrated on a periodic basis every six months or whatever, um, as well as typically if a part is damaged, dropped on the floor, automatically goes for recalibration. So. Uh, it's important to think about how things are calibrated and how the accuracy of those calibrations is determined. Um, same thing with materials. Any material that's used to go into the turbine should be, so to speak, um, qualified. So there's direct materials, obviously the alloys, the weld wire, coating powders, and so on. Spare parts all need to be qualified. But also there's a whole bunch of indirect materials that get onto your, uh, into your engine. Process gases that are used for welding, grit media, solvents, even markers and so on that get onto parts uh, need to be qualified because they can be sources of error, that can be sources of failures. Right? Um, then in, in terms of inspection during the repair processes, there's a whole bunch of inspection techniques for things that you can see. You know, cracks, surface corrosion, impact, fretting, erosion, those sorts of things. What you see is what you get. Um, there's a whole bunch of dimensional integrity things that you can measure, wall thicknesses, distortion, uh, flow testing, and things like that. Um, but then there's a whole class of things that are in there that, that you can't necessarily see. Internal features and microstructural things, things that you can't necessarily measure non-destructively. Things like uh, alloy condition, gamma prime aging, grain boundaries, carbide precipitation, and that. Uh, they're tougher to look for. Um, non-destructively. In fact, you often can't. You have to use witness coupons and so on. Um, and then in terms of repair, the type of repair that was done, whether it was minor, medium, or major, which are kind of purchasing labels. Uh, they, they don't mean a whole lot to me, but um, purchasing people love that sort of stuff. So in the, in the inspection techniques, um, there's a whole bunch of direct red techniques, the so-called wissy wigs or what you see is what you get um, type techniques. Um, uh, visual, dimensional, fluorescent, penetrant, mag particle, radiography. These are all things that you see and can quantify by looking at them. Um, I don't want to say the lay person can do it, but yes, the lay person can do it. Um, then there's indirect techniques. They require interpretation by somebody who knows the process. Chemical analysis, eddy current, ultrasonic, are all techniques that are read, you're reading a signal, 
Um, so, you know, one of the things is like I put in here, com computed tomography, CAT scanning. Is a CAT scanning, is it a direct technique? Well, it's directly read, but it relies on computer models. So it's kind of in the gray area. Here's an example here of some dimensional checks that might be done, uh, for example, for restoration reasons. So in the last part of the, the talk here, and I think I've gone over time a wee bit, I've put in a whole bunch of different inspection methods and the ASTM standards, for example, and what, what those techniques will do. And again, we'll pass this out and you can have a look-see at those at your convenience. Um, I've also got in here a whole bunch of selected reference, and most of these are on the internet so that you can grab them easily. Um, uh, some different examples uh, that are on the internet and a couple of references. And also I wanted to introduce the fact that the ASM has released a new uh, metals handbook on failure analysis, which includes a, a chapter by Kevin Weens, who some of you might know. He's one of my coworkers. He's been uh, working at Liberty for 20 years or so. And uh, he's done a really bang up job of doing some classic failure analysis test case studies in there. So I think that pretty much brings me to the end of where I wanted to be in my in the time allotted. Uh, in conclusion, I think diligence is your best tool as an owner operator. Understand your systems, keep an eye on your systems, and keep those eyes open to uh, anything that can, because anything that can can go wrong will go wrong. Right? That's Murphy's law. So go forth and don't fail. So I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that was interesting and be happy to handle questions. I'd just like to say thanks to Doug Nagy for a great presentation um, and for, you know, allowing uh, everyone, not just users to to attend and, and, and learn from this training course. Uh, so, Doug, there is a question out here for you, uh, and it is, what is your experience with the recoding of internal diffusion coatings of blades or burners? Blades or burners, okay. Um, we, in our shop, we replace internal coatings fairly regularly and typically they're diffused aluminides. Um, sometimes they're modified aluminides, platinum aluminides or, or uh, silicon aluminides or whatever. Um, my experience is getting the old coating off is probably the most difficult thing and surface preparation prior to recoding. That's probably the biggest challenge from a repair perspective. When I start thinking about failure analysis, um, it's not unusual to see parts come out of the factory that have little bare spots inside because the original OEM coating process didn't necessarily get there or maybe there was dirt on the surface or whatever. Um, so you had a bare spot and then that would burn from the inside out. Um, that's probably the most common failure risk with internal coatings. And when you go to recoat them, those areas that are burned up and scaled won't be clean and therefore won't coat the second time either. So it's a real challenge. And because you cannot easily inspect inside the hollow areas, um, it's a real unknown. <laughs> so that's my take on it. Okay, Doug, um, there's certainly many people singing uh, your praise. Um, <laughs> and we did a question that just come in. Are, are there any NDE techniques that you can identify? I mean, that can identify the remaining life of any compressor blades subjected to HCF due to excitation. Great question, great question. Um, when you think about HCF, you've got a vibrating blade, say, and then you've got initiation site, or at least somewhere where the crack is gonna start. That part will vibrate for a long time before that crack initiates and can be detected. So you can have a part that's been exposed to vibration and therefore has latent damage that you don't know about, um, and you cannot see it. Um, Theoretically, from a metallurgical point of view, one could take a sample metal up, piece of the metal out, sample it, and look for uh, dislocation buildups. Theoretically, um, not really seen a lot of success with that quantitatively, and certainly that's not non-destructive. 
So that's very difficult question uh, or a very difficult scenario. How do you recover from that? Arguably, if one were to heat treat the part, uh, one would be able to anneal out those dislocations. But having said that, heat treating of compressor blades is a very unusual thing to do for a variety of reasons. Um, shot peening, the role of shot peening is to introduce a compressive stress in the surface that counteracts the tensile stress in service. So if you've got a part that has um, some exposure to HCF, arguably peening it would help. Um, I can't say that I've seen any uh, any real studies that I could quantify that with. Yeah, that's a, that that is a sticky problem. Non-visible damage is really hard to analyze. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that, I'm afraid. All right, Doug, uh, I don't see any more questions, but I, I think we can hang on for a minute here. If anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask Doug a question or comment on anything uh, from today. And I have some, I have a few questions that were sent to me in advance, and, and I'll just make a couple comments on those if we didn't touch on them. Somebody asked the question about water washing effectiveness for industrial turbines. Um, the role of water wash is to remove deposits and clean out the engine so that the compressor runs efficiently. And in an industrial turbine, you should be able to look at your compressor delivery pressure and temperature to tell when your compressor is losing its efficiency. And that's when you want to go in there and water wash. And yes, that's a very effective strategy and actually a fairly common strategy. Uh, there are companies that will sell software to tell you when to wash and there's companies that will sell you a whole washing apparatus. Um, somebody asked if trending can predict failure and I would say yes, it absolutely can as long as you look at the trends. If you don't look, you won't see. Somebody asked if underfiring can extend turbine component life. Yes, it can. Uh, any of the damage mechanisms that are temperature related, oxidation of the coatings, corrosion of the coatings, um, even aging of the alloy and therefore creep damage can be, uh, can be minimized by lowering the temperatures, absolutely. In the bad old days, there used to be this concept of free time when you were operating at uh, idle and you could run the engine and you didn't really have to clock that as burning time. I don't think too many operators do that anymore, but it's theoretically possible. And I think if you've got you know, a good prognostic system or a good uh, uh, health monitoring system, you might be able to do that. Um, somebody asked about looseness on stator veins. Um, and we talked about excitation of stators because of the wakes, um, and that can do induce cracks. One of the things it can also do is the dovetails or the attachment points of the stator veins. Uh, it can cause during the during the movement, it can cause them to fret, and then those dovetails become thin and may eventually break off. And yeah, that is a failure mode of uh, of some compressor designs. And the solution to that is to stop the vibration either by clocking the veins or somehow modifying their shape so they don't resonate, or in some cases, locking several veins together into a segment so that they dampen each other. So that's, that's one way of dealing with loose stator veins. Another person asked about row zero blade erosion. I think they're talking about F-class GE compressors. Um, so the row zero is the very first rotating blade in the GE frame series of engines. And it's very, very sensitive to erosion, particularly the lower leading edge of the so-called row zero part of the blade. I've actually got a blade here, down here. Um, and so my take on that as a metallurgist is that that blade is overstressed. There's so much stress on there that even teeny tiny little erosion spots and teeny tiny little corrosion pits can cause enough of a stress intensity to cause a high cycle fatigue crack to run across and the blade to fail. So for me, it's because the blade is overstressed, not because the material is deficient. 
So yes, you have to look out for row zero erosion in those F-class compressors um, because they are so sensitive. And if it was up to me, and if I was redesigning it, I would lower the design stresses on that blade. Um, okay, that's the questions that I had. We, we had uh, two more questions come in in the chat. Sure. Um, how would you determine when it's necessary to clean inlet chiller coils? Hmm. When they're dusty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my... That's a good question. Um, most inlet pressure drop is going to be across your filters, right? If there's enough debris building up on the chiller coils that they're causing a pressure drop, you might be able to pick it up on pressure drop. But my guess is that there's not enough pressure drop across them. And probably the only way to do that is by physical examination, you know, a monthly crawl through or something like that. Um, I think that's probably the only way to tell. Any other technique I can think of, uh, you'd be looking for a very, very small signal and it'd be hard to discern. Does somebody else have a better idea? Can you talk a little bit about issues with inlet bleed heat and what specific types of damage you could see on the compressor? Well, if the bleed heat isn't working, you're going to see that ice that we spoke of. Um, if the bleed heat is heating too much, you're going to see uh, your compressor efficiency drop off because of the less poundage of air going through. And that means the turbine section is going to work harder. Um, I can't say that I've seen a failure associated in the turbine because of the bleed heat. Um, if they want to rephrase the question, maybe I can help them, but um, I don't know of any failure modes of the turbine. I mean, if the heater's not working, then you could be wasting energy or wasting other resources. Do you think that you'd see any rubs? I don't think so. The bleed heat isn't going to warm the metal enough that it's going to uh, thermally expand enough to rub. I wouldn't think so. I don't think so. And I'm assuming it's not like the piping is broken to the point where it's upset the airflow. Um, okay, well, we've got one more here. Uh, we sometimes see a very high pressure drop due to pollen on the exchanger and use a special filter foam in front, which can be exchanged. Okay, all right. Yeah, I've, I've seen that on air conditioning in buildings for sure. Um, and, and you get that in gas turbines sometimes where there's uh, locusts or, or other insects that, uh, that mass, um, you can get that sort of thing. All right, yeah, again, back to the point of, is there enough pressure drop uh, such that you can detect it? Or is there enough uh, absence of heat rejection in the therm thermodynamics of the piping that you can detect the presence of the pollen? I don't know if you could see those signals. Certainly, you'd see it on a crawl through. And yes, if you're if you're near a farmer's field or something like that where there's a single crop and it all pollinates over one or two days, it can plug things up quite quickly. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any right now, Doug, but thanks for offering up, uh, you know, the presentation slides to the attendees and uh, we'll also be sending out a recording of uh, today's short course. Um, and, you know, keep us informed uh, when, when, you're, when your long course is gonna be, because I'm sure that there's uh, gonna be a lot of people who are on today that will be interested in, in attending. Well, as we dig out of this pandemic, I, I hope to see a lot more people face to face. Um, Scott, is there a technology for you to capture the, the chat questions and e e email it to me or something? I've got them all. Okay, because then I'll, I'll make sure that I, you know, respond to those questions uh, with some detail if I can. That's great. Thanks so much, Doug.
Well, I want to thank everybody for, for coming out. I don't know how many people showed up. I, I think there was like 200 or so who uh, registered. So that's a phenomenal number. I'm, I'm honored by that. And I, I hope I've done you, done you right. All right, Doug, you got a lot of thumbs up uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of applause. And thanks again for joining us. And we'll be in touch with the uh, the recording and the presentation slides for all the attendees. Um, if you're interested in generators tomorrow, we have a very similar course uh, going on uh, on generators where you can sign up for that at CCJ online.com. That's going to be uh, taught by Howard Mowdy of National Electric Coil uh, and it's if you like today's you'll also like tomorrow's that's for sure. Sounds like a good plan. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you Thank next you time. Very much. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate the hosting. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, right. Doug. Bye-bye.